Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first mini lecture today. We are going to talk about what is American public discourse, this thing we're supposed to be studying, and why exactly should we study it. Uh, this is uh, all my own notes, but I am drawing heavily on a book from one of my mentors. It is American Rhetorical Discourse by Ronald Reed and my mentor, James Klump. Uh, that is one of the suggested books for this course. Uh, it was not required, but if you want to follow along, I do draw heavily on the introduction to that book, um, even though these are my expanded and revised ideas from it. So let's go ahead and jump right in. What exactly is American public discourse? So I define it in four parts. It is communication that frames the subject addressed as a concern of the community defined as American. And again, that's a little bit dense, so I think it's helpful if we break that down and I give you some additional notes about each of these four parts. I do suggest pausing the video and taking notes as we go through these, not just writing down what I have. Obviously, you can go back and watch the video, uh, but taking notes in your own words. Translate this into how you'll look at the speeches, how you'll study. Uh, so make sure that you're doing that. Feel free to pause the video as we move through each of the four parts of the this definition. So we begin with communication. And I think the first thing that's important to note is that communication is a contested subject within the field of rhetoric. What communication actually counts as public discourse? Uh, so some scholars will argue that it is really only speeches, uh, that speeches, especially face-to-face -face speeches, are the primary means of public address. Uh, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the age of the internet. I've never actually been to a political speech. I've watched them on television or seen what they tweeted or listened to them on a YouTube video later. Uh, so I tend to think of communication much more as discourse which addresses a public uh, so any communication from uh, a, a tweet to a half a million followers up through a presidential uh, inaugural address. Uh, and I tend to see any of that as uh, communication um, that is relevant to American public discourse. And you'll see why as we get later in the definition. I'll circle back around to this a little bit, but do keep that in mind. Presentation versus reception is another big uh, conundrum that vexes communication and rhetoric scholars. Uh, do we care about whether it is presented as public discourse or whether it is received as public discourse? I don't have a favorite answer on this one. I'm very pragmatic. Whatever uh, is justifying the text that I really want to study, that's the one that's important to me at that time. Effects are another big important one. Should we pay attention to whether or not something actually happened after the speech or not? Uh, that, though, raises questions about who we're listening to. Because obviously, if a president or prime minister or senator says something, there's much more likely to be an effect immediately after because they have the force of law behind them. Whereas if I say something or your mom says something or your pastor says something, it's less likely to have an immediate instrumental effect because of the power differential. So I don't necessarily think about effects as vital to communication. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, speeches versus all of the other forms of communication. Speeches tend to be the traditional things uh, that, is, that have happened. They tend to be the traditional things that we will study in this class. I won't limit us to speeches. There are other things that have become part of public discourse that we will study. Um, but obviously sermons and presidential speeches and things that were where someone stood up at a podium and gave a lecture to a crowd um, were a primary way of talking to people uh, for a lot of years. So we will study a number of those. But keep in mind that not everything that is public discourse is a speech. So the first part of that definition is communication. The second part is that frames the subject addressed. And here there's a few important things to think about. Can any subject be the subject of public discourse? You might immediately say, well, yeah, of course, anything could, or no, there are lots of things that wouldn't be the subject of public discourse. But I would challenge you 
on both counts. For instance, you might think, well, somebody's sex life wouldn't be public discourse, and I would show you to Bill Clinton. Or you might think, well, of course, anything can be part of public discourse, and I will ask how much you have heard recently about presidential dental hygiene. As I say, this has a question mark after it, any subject, and that's because any subject addressed is going to be framing, not finding. That's important here, framing a subject, not finding a subject. And this is absolutely vital to how we're going to study public address, because we are going to study communication that goes out and frames something for an audience. That is, these issues don't just exist out in the world and then some speaker stumbles upon them like a fossil finder. Instead, the speaker frames an issue, comes to the speech with goals, ideas, uh, maybe machinations of some kind, but they frame their subject addressed. And that means that rhetoric, the kind of rhetoric that we're studying here is constitutive. That means it is shaped and shaping. Write that down. Constitutive is a word you are going to hear me say lots and lots. In these videos, in our mini lectures, in the class prep that I ask you to do in our in-class discussions, we are going to talk about constitutive rhetoric. It means rhetoric that shapes and is shaped. Now, this means that we create things in our world through rhetoric. We frame subjects to be important. We uh, identify things that are meaningful to us. And we build those things. They don't just exist out there for us to go and find. We as speakers and the speakers that we will study make decisions on how to constitute or create the world around them. The third part of our definition is that communication that frames the subject of dress as of concern to the community. As of concern to the community. This means the communicator is the advisor and they are responsible and they are intelligent. This is an inherent thing that we see as part of uh, speaking in public in America. When a communicator stands up, we expect them a priori, even though that doesn't exist, we expect them to function as an advisor. We expect them to be responsible. We expect them to be intelligent. This is a deeply ingrained ethos of American public discourse. Whether or not someone is actually advisable or responsible or intelligent matters less than that our culture expects that they will be. What does this mean? This means that public discourse has its own credibility. The very act of standing up to speak makes someone think that you are more knowledgeable as a speaker. The very act of standing up to speak makes people in your audience think you're a more knowledgeable speaker. Think about the power there. Think about the potential harms. Another thing that's important is that community in this identifier is seen as advisable. We are, as a community, those who are willing to be advised. We are seeking knowledge and we are reasonable. Have you ever known a crowd to be reasonable? Do you know people in your life who perhaps are unreasonable at times? Do you know people who sometimes do not seek knowledge? How about people who won't take any good advice? All of those things are true, and yet our culture of American public discourse assumes that people are seeking advice, seeking knowledge, and that they are reasonable. There again, think of the power of that cultural definition. If you stand up to speak, the people who are listening to you are instantly given more ethos as well. Again, think of the power and the potential harms.
And this is where we get into something called the public. This is a created or called into being entity that has a mind of its own. It is not just a collective of individuals. The public itself exists in our definition of American public discourse, called together by the very act of speaking to them. Constituted, wink, wink, if you will. And then finally, communication that frames the subject addressed as of concern uh, to the community defined as American. And this gets to the very core of how we'll study public address. The speaker defines the audience but cannot define the listeners. And that is because American is inherently rhetorical. American for the purposes of public discourse, is a rhetorically constructed entity. You are American when you're part of the audience. You are American when a speaker calls you into being. You are American when you are addressed by a public speaker. That was a very powerful concept that we'll explore from the founding of what American was through our present day. Okay, cool, Dr. Steyer, but like, um, so what? That, that sounds like any other reason you would give me in a history class or anything else. Cool. I can see you typing the shrug emoji into your notes right now. So let's talk a little bit about the why. Why do we need to study this? We study public discourse for the past, the present, and the future. Public discourse is the intellectual history of our shared values. Public discourse is the genealogy of our current lives, politics, and cultures. And public discourse is the well we draw from to shape our discourse in the future. Let's dive into each of those, past, present, and future, just a little bit. We study public address because it is the intellectual history of our past. It's the record of how others have overcome tribulation. We're going through a lot of hard stuff in the country right now. But people have overcome hard things in this country before. Don't you want to know how they did it? It is the evidence of how we have succeeded. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had a roadmap of how this country has succeeded in the past and we could use it to deal with the challenges we face today? And yes, it is the game tape of when we failed. Anyone who has studied American history more than just in high school will tell you that there have been some failures in this country. We have overcome many, but we have sometimes failed. Wouldn't it be amazing to use those like a game tape, to go back like a football coach and avoid the mistakes we made in the past, to do it better when we come to the present? Because public address is the genealogy of what we believe today. And I want you to think about that metaphor because it's just beautiful. It is our genealogical lineage. Why do we believe the things that we do today? Why do you hold your politics or your faith? Why do you believe the theologies that you do or the uh, personal goals that you have? It is the... Uh, ideas of who shaped the things and ideas on which we currently act. Public address gives us the ideas and the ability to trace who said the things that now shape what we're talking about when we're dealing with the present. It is the study of what came before which silently impacts us now. And it is who our ancestors are and what DNA they have passed on to us. Perhaps you're a really great athlete because of the uh, DNA your ancestors passed on to you and it's shaping your life today. Or maybe you unfortunately inherited something much less delightful from your ancestors' DNA. In the same way, public address helps us understand where we are in the, few, in the present. But even more than that, public address is about your future. Public address is the resources that you will use tomorrow when you need to shape the world. 
Public address holds the ideas you will bring to the world as you make it a better place. Public address shapes the performances you will create to improve your world. Public address is the future you create. Now you will have new ideas. You will build on the DNA your ancestors left for you. But in the same way that we are passed down genealogical inherited traits physically, we are passed down rhetorical inheritances as well. And by studying American public discourse, we are able to shape our future.